project and their employees at, at GPI. Okay, uh, Tampa Bay Water, uh, my client, the largest wholesale supplier of water in Florida, serving over 2.3 million people in the northern Tampa Bay area. And um, they've consistently advocated the use of sound science to study and address environmental impacts associated with water supply over the 20 or so years that we've been working together. I want to draw your attention to these gray shapes here. These represent the, the water supply facilities or well fields. So you'll hear, hear me talk about some of those, including the STK or Starkey well field, which is one of the groundwater supply well fields. And um, these well fields are pumping water from the Florida aquifer uh, to provide the drinking water. I also want to draw your attention here to these surface water sources in green. In more recent years, Tampa Bay Water, has, their overall water portfolio has shifted more in the direction of surface water supply. So we have a reservoir here that captures high water flows from the Alafaya River. And the reservoir was filled for the first time in 2005. And they also have a desal plant that's been um, extracting water from seawater. So this is sort of the, the newer surface water sources to supplement the, the groundwater. Historically, um, during a time of higher production, which also included a drought period, uh, water levels were low in many of the wetlands, uh, especially on the well field areas. So I want to take a minute to just describe how this figure was made. This is actually the result of processing median water levels from 270 different monitored wetlands during uh, the time period 1997 to 2002. Now, if I were to just take median water levels and perform a spatial interpolation of them over an area of this size, what you would actually see is you would see more or less the elevation, the changing topography um, from uh, the high part down to the low part near the water. And so in order to uh, remove the artifact of elevation, what I did first was subtracted from each of those median water levels a local representation of the wetland edge datum. And so we're calling that the history historical normal pool. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is in a moment. But the important thing to note here is that this gives you a, a, a picture of what's actually happening to water levels in the wetland. And so I want to point out some of these areas that are right near uh, the, the production wells, they're, they're orange and red on this map. That means that the water level in the wetlands in those areas was more than six or six feet below the historical normal pool. Other areas distant from production um, and uh, potentially also in areas where there's more confinement between the Florida aquifer and the superficial aquifer, you see that the water levels were within about two feet of the historical normal pool during the same time period. Just a little bit more about the historical normal pool concept. This has really emerged as an, as an important concept, particularly in the southwest district of Florida, where it's used in uh, water use permit compliance and for other regulatory activities. And so uh, this person is holding a pen at what we call the cypress buttress inflection point. This, uh, the cypress trees, this is a very reliable indicator of the historic normal pool level. And it, it typically, it really could have been called the historic high pool because it's associated with the P2 to the P10, meaning the water level the, the, the highest water levels that are only reached every 2% to 10% of the time. So really this level rep could be called the high pool and, and you typically see it at the end of the rainy season. Now, when I walk into a wetland, I can get a good idea of what's been going on with the hydrology of the wetland because you have these historic indicators like the cypress buttress and you also have more recent indicators like the moss collar here. And what you'll see is in wetlands that are, that are drying out over time, you'll actually see the moss collar creep down on these trees. And so you can get an idea of the hydrology. But what happens when the water table is maintained at a low level? Well, as you can imagine, the, the soils in the wetlands are, are used to anaerobic conditions and develop under anaerobic conditions. If you dry them out, you can have a very rapid and large amount of soil subsidence or oxidation. That's what happened in this cypress wetland. All the cypress trees fell down and were replaced by upland species. Um, this wetland had over four feet of soil loss, for example. In a marsh or lake system, it may not look as dramatic, but we do have changes to the soils and we have upland plants that have become established in the interior. So the real changes to the structure and function of the wetland. So in response to this, Tampa Bay Water cut back their water production in a big way. Um, the red line represents the 12-period moving average 
and they, they went from around 158 million gallons a day to down below 110 million gallons a day in January 2003. So that's this blue line here representing January. And um, production has actually been maintained below 90 million gallons a day consistently since 2010, and which is because of that shift of the water production to the surface water withdrawals. Certain well fields weren't able to cut back right at that time period. For example, the Starkey well well, so they actually needed an additional pipeline installed to allow system flexibility. So the cutback time period for Starkey was in December 2007, when it dropped below 6 MGD, and um, it's mostly been below 4 MGD as well since then. So with these big cutbacks in production, how do we know that the affected lakes and wetlands have actually recovered? Um, well, for isolated cypress wetlands and cypress fringe lakes, we have some guidance from the Florida Administrative Code. And there's this concept called the minimum level. Uh, and if the median water level is within 1.8 feet of the historical normal pool, that's considered to be uh, a healthy wetland or an unchanged wetland. So we can use this as guidance and say that if, if we can get the median water level of these formerly stressed wetlands to above 1.8 feet below the normal pool, we would consider them hydrologically recovered. And we expect that vegetation and hydric soils will also improve, but we recognize that they're going to lag the hydrologic recovery. So here's an example of that recovery in one of these isolated cypress wetlands. And the, this line that goes up and down, this is the hydrograph over time. This is over 25 years of water level data. You can see that the water levels bounce around a lot. Here's that normal pool level. So that's pretty much the maximum for this particular wetland. And um, this brown line represents the wetland bottom. So you can see that uh, during the periods of high pumpage, the water level was actually mostly below the wetland bottom most of the time. And then here's our cutback, and now we see more occurrences of the water above ground. We also see that the long-term median, this is a six-year median calculation, that the six-year median, after the cutback, it didn't immediately rise, but um, by the time we get to about 2013, it's above that, that minimum level, the minus 1.8 feet. So we consider this to be a hydrologically recovered wetland and a success story from a, a recovery perspective. Now, um, I will say that, that there's a certain aspect of this wetland that's important. Although this rule only applies to isolated cypress wetlands and cypress fringe lakes, we actually believe it should apply more narrowly and that it should apply to those cypress sites that are considered to be surrounded predominantly by mevic soils. I'm going to explain what I mean by that in a minute. Um, we, in, in past studies, we realized that there, there were certain sites that didn't seem to behave the same as the more typical mesic cypress sites. Like, for example, this is what we call a sandhill lake or a xeric associated lake site. Um, it's a deeper site and it's surrounded by well drained sandy soils. Uh, this is a sand pine scrub type habitat or sandhill habitat. And so because of these larger fluctuations, these wetlands just tend to naturally have lower water levels. So GPI did a study, and we were able to determine that a more appropriate threshold for these sites, instead of minus 1.8 below the normal pool, was minus 3.1. You can see that in this figure. So using this information for a, a cypress that's surrounded by the xeric soil type, or has a high percentage xeric in it, we, we see this in this hydrograph we were now also getting recovery at a similar time of the six-year median water level above this, um, this lower threshold, the minus 3.1. So we're also calling this a recovered site, MP17, because it's a xeric site, and you can see when the six-year median went above that level. So this is fine for the monitored sites, but how do we assess recovery of unmonitored sites? We, we, we found that there were over 675 wetlands and nine lakes in an area of concern, this two-foot surficial aquifer system drawdown area, so quite a large number of sites with no information. And that's really the challenge of this study, was to develop methods for the accurate classification of these unmonitored wetlands into what we call recovery assessment bins for further action. Some of these sites would be considered never impacted or recovered. Other sites would be considered improved but not fully recovered. And so those might just require adaptive management going forward and, and monitoring what's happening. Some sites would be not fully recovered and continuing impact, meaning that the recovery is not sufficient. So we need to look at other options for those sites. Some sites might also have um, other causes for impacts. For example, surface water drainage systems like ditching. 
And so for those sites, we would call them more detailed analysis needed. And there's two approaches that, that I'm going to talk about today, and it's based on looking at water level recovery of unmonitored sites, and that's using the technique of regression creeping, and then also uh, interpolating ecological conditions using inverse distance weighting. So the basic idea being that we can use information from nearby sites to estimate conditions of these unmonitored sites. First, I'll talk about the water levels. Um, starting off with the linear regression. So this is actually a 200-year-old statistical technique, if you can believe it. Uh, it's been around a long time, and many of you are very familiar with it. Um, it involves using an explanatory variable, uh, x, to predict y, the dependent variable. And this is based on fitting a line of best fit that minimizes the uh, sum of squared residuals. So that there's one line of best fit, and um, you identify that, and then you can use this line to make predictions. So um, you can use it to fill, obviously fill in predictions for um, uh, anywhere along that line. And um, certain assumptions of this technique, the thing I want to point out here is that, you know, no statistical model is perfect. There's always going to be these residuals that are, are the aspect that was not accurately predicted. So you might have positive residuals, which are above the line, negative residuals that are below the line. <clears throat> if there's any pattern in your residuals, as a statistician, you should recognize that you could do a better job with your modeling. If there's some residual pattern that's not random, then you could, you could model that pattern and therefore improve your overall prediction. Like, for example, if there were a cluster of points where they all had a positive residual, you could recognize that, and then when you wanted to predict something in that location, you would probably also want to apply a small positive residual to that prediction, and therefore you would improve your overall prediction. This is the concept behind regression creeping. And of course, uh, as many of you know, you could also add another variable here, and you would end up predicting instead of a, a line of best fit, you'd be predicting a plane of best fit. So let's talk about creeping. Now, instead of 200 years old, we're talking about a 70-year-old technique developed by uh, a mining engineer, a South African mining engineer, to help find gold. And the idea here is that you you can develop a spatially weighted average at, at each location based on the data that you have. And the important thing to realize is that there is a specific function that decides how much weighting to give each point. And that's based on a statistical analysis using the variogram technique. So this is an example of a variogram. Um, so what we have on the x-axis is lag distance. And then on the y-axis, it's a measure of the variability of the differences. And what we find is that at, at uh, small distances, there tend to be smaller differences between, between uh, predictions. So in case of our wetlands, it would be that there were small differences in normal pool offsets. And then at larger distances, you tend to have larger, uh, larger uh, differences between the values. So this shape right here can actually be modeled using what's called an empirical variogram. Um, at a certain distance, though, there's no more spatial autocorrelation benefit. So basically, you've reached an uncorrelated area of your data set, and that's called the range. And this is really geostatistics. So this brings us to the regression creeping approach. The idea is to develop the best aspatial model we have that includes the, the most important independent predictor variables while avoiding overfitting so that the model will do well in the future. Then we add to it our understanding of any residual spatial variation by performing creeping on the residuals from the multivariate model. This yields the best possible model, incorporating both aspatial and spatial trends. Here's an overview of the sites that we had data for in the northern Tampa Bay area. So after screening out certain sites that, you know, were not appropriate, such as those that were, for example, getting some, some inputs from surface water systems and things like that, we ended up with uh, 309 sites with median water level normal pool offsets calculated for the 2008 to 2014 period. So really a very dense sample size. And this is just kind of to zoom in to show you the kind of variability that we saw in the data set. Uh, right here on the boundary of one of the well field areas, uh, on the well field, you had normal pool offsets where the median water levels were between 10 and 19 feet below the normal pool. Uh, but then right just a short distance away, the water levels were within 2.5 feet of the normal pool. 
So these kind of abrupt changes can be challenging to model statistically. Here's another example. On the Morris Bridge Wellfield area, we had, um, we had a point uh, minus, minus 0.6 surrounded by, um, uh, surrounded by sites with a smaller uh, normal pull offset. First thing we did was transform the dependent variable, the historical normal pool offset, to achieve normality, and um, and did a did a pretty good job of it with this particular transformation. I did have to take a small, a very small number of sites had slight positive normal pool offsets, like 0.1 or 0.2. Those I made zero prior to applying the transformation. And one thing to keep in mind with this, when you're transforming the dependent variable, just realize that you're going to end up with asymmetric prediction intervals when you get done and you want to back transform your data. That's one thing to keep in mind when you do that. We then looked at a lot of different variables to try to pick the best aspatial model. And um, I used something called Bayesian Information Criterion Search, I essentially calculated all possible subsets of these variables and picked the one that had the, um, the, the most probable model given the data, which is what the BIC search does. And just to um, show you how simple this is in R, this is the very brief code that was used to actually search uh, 4,250 models. And um, so here's some of the parameters that we looked at. Aquifer-related parameters, such as the superficial aquifer drawdown, upper Florida drawdown, soils-related parameters, like the xeric ratio, how much of the soils around were xeric, uh, well-related, such as the distance to nearest wells or a kernel density of wells, and um, uh, there were other parameters I looked at, including rainfall. I want to just show you some examples of those. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just so you get a, a feeling for uh, the data set. Surficial drawdown was provided as a model output by Tampa Bay Water. And this represents uh, an estimate from the model of uh, how much the surficial aquifer is changed from historical non-pumping conditions. So what you can see with this graphic is that when you're on the well field areas, particularly in the centers of the well field, you tend to have the largest amount of predicted drawdown in the surficial aquifer. So we were interested in seeing would this help predict what's happening in the wetlands. Another variable we looked at was the soils. And um, in a previous study, we had classified all of the soils in these three counties based on whether they were xeric, mesic, or wetland. So the wetland soils are gray. We can ignore those. Uh, the xeric soils are those that support that sand pine scrub, scrubby flatwoods, and other xeric communities. And the, uh, the, the green are other natural communities that aren't considered xeric, like pine flatwoods is a common upland community in Florida. So we do this buffer, and then we calculate the ratio of xeric soils to, to the combination of xeric and mesic to come up with a ratio. And we found that 27% is a good cutoff when you're talking about a xeric, a xeric soil. We also looked at upper Florida aquifer drawdown, and this was based on calculating a difference between two, two different uh, data sets. One was a pre-development surface uh, obtained from the USGS, and then another was some median upper Florida aquifer potentiometric surface calculations performed by uh, Lee and Fouad. And uh, they didn't quite, it wasn't a perfect match to our time period, but we thought it was still useful to take a look at. And the upper Florida aquifer, by the way, for those who aren't familiar with the hydrogeology, lies beneath a confining unit or a partially, uh, partially intact confining unit. And then you have the superficial aquifer, then we have the wetland. Also looked at distance to nearest well, although this, this may not be representative because certain wells are not turned on all the time. We had a couple of data sets from a statewide study done by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection called the FAVA study, or the Florida Aquifer Vulnerability Assessment. And this is an example of one of those layers. It's head difference. So it would be the difference in the potentiometric level uh, between the superficial aquifer and the Florida aquifer. Soil permeability was also available from FAVA. And this is a measure of how uh, quickly the, or easily the water can move through the soils. Intermediate aquifer thickness is a representation of um, how thick the intermediate confining unit is that separates the two aquifers. And actually, in much of the northern Tampa Bay area, uh, 
Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about this, but many of the areas are, are considered to be unconfined, which means there's not really uh, an intermediate aquifer located there. So this statewide data set, we later concluded, had sort of limited applicability to our area, and in further work, we're, we're excluding it. But it was included in this preliminary study. Also looked at rainfall. And um, this is simply the mean rainfall for the time period of interest from 11 stations that we had data for. And you can see that there's a general trend that the rainfall during this period was higher, um, closer to the coast, and it was drier further inland. So there's a question about whether that would have an influence. Looked at the density of wells using a kernel density estimate. And again, this may not be representative because there are a lot of older, smaller wells that are non, no longer used on Elder Twild, so that's not really a, a, a likely to be directly connected to wetland water levels. So what do we find? Um, after running the code, this is the result. We get this beautiful graph, and uh, we have one point down here. That represents the most likely model given the data uh, that, we, that we looked at out of all those 4,000 models, and it included these three variables, superficial drawdown, Xeric ratio and intermediate aquifer thickness. I also just, because the linear regression has certain assumptions and, and we didn't look for interactions, things like that, I wanted to just take another data mining approach and I used the random forest, which is kind of an out of the box machine learning technique that is another way of looking at variable importance. And I'm not going to go into detail about the random forest here um, because it could be a whole talk on its own, but it's basically the idea is you're creating regression trees using subsets of your data. And so each tree is trying to decide what's the most important variable to split the tree. Well, it turns out maybe xeric ratio is the most important var variable. And the second most important variable is drawdown. And this is based on thousands of trees. And so the, the take home message though is that random forest, which is a very different technique and can allow things like interaction terms, um, we, we end up seeing that these two variables were also important in this, amount, in this technique. Uh, drawdown and zero ratio. So we'll keep that in mind. Intermediate thickness, not as important. Okay, linear regression model. I went ahead and allowed interactions when I ran the regression model from those important variables and came up with a model that explains 33% of the variation, R squared of 33%. Now, rather than showing you all of these, what these estimates are uh, numerically, I'd like to show you visually using the VisReg package in R. So my code got covered up here, I think, but it's just a very short uh, line of code that basically allows you to plot the partial residuals um, for, for the graphic. And so these are partial residuals from the regression, meaning that the other factors in the regression are held constant and you're plotting the residuals. So as with, um, with the other factors constant, as, temp as the dr superficial aquifer drawdown increases, you actually have lowering water levels. I know they look like they go up, that's because this is a transformed variable, so that's why they look like they go up. But, um, but the point is, this is exactly what we would have expected, right? Uh, xeric ratio also shows that as xeric ratio increases, as the, soil, as the site is surrounded by more xeric soils, you also see lower water levels at a higher xeric ratio. And we found that there was an interaction, so that um, this, this basically sites that had no xeric soils around them had this particular relationship to superficial aquifer drawdown. Yes, at higher drawdown, you had lower water levels, but the effect was not very extreme. On the other hand, sites that were 100% surrounded by xeric soils, um, you actually see quite an extreme effect whereby a smaller amount of drawdown seems to be associated with lower water levels. Intermediate aquifer thickness came out as significant only in terms of its interaction. And this actually is counterintuitive. It suggests that um, the same amount of drawdown results in lower water levels when you actually have a thicker confining layer, which is counterintuitive. So we think that this was somewhat of an artifact and, and, and may not be uh, useful going forward, this particular variable. Took the residuals from the regression and performed uh, craving on them. And sure enough, there was significant spatial autocorrelation in residuals. And you can tell that because uh, this, this line slopes up like this. If, uh, if these points were all flat, straight across, 
then regression Krieging would not be the appropriate technique. There'd be no point in doing the Krieging at that point because there's no residual spatial autocorrelation in the residuals. We did have it, so it was worth doing. It should result in a better prediction. And indeed it does. The regression Krieging model now explains 52% of the variation in the data. Uh, sounds great, or better anyway. Now, I will say, though, that what we really want is a realistic estimate of out-of-sample performance. And uh, I think I'll, I'll just say, hopefully most of you are familiar with this, some of you may not be. It's very important when you're running your statistical procedures that you recognize that the R squared you get um, from the data that you actually fitted is not going to be a representative R squared for new data sets. Because you could have partially, when you calculated your, your, your line of best fit, you could in part be fitting to noise in the data set. And so to try to see how much of this is fitting to noise and how much of this is real, you can do something like cross-validation. In this case, it's a leave one out cross-validation, meaning that we basically re-performed the regression and the Krieging for instead of 309 points, we did it for 308 points, and we held out one point. Then we calculated the residual value for that one point, knowing that we actually know the point. Uh, and then we iterated through the entire data set doing that. Then we held out point number 307 and then point 306, et cetera. The result is that you build up an estimate of the out-of-sample performance of the model. Here, the out-of-sample performance gives us around a 36% R-squared. It doesn't sound great, but actually when you look at the back-transformed residuals, from the model, you can see that it's not, it's not biased. The median is around zero. And you can see that uh, uh, most of the data are encompassed by plus or minus a half a foot. So these out of sample predictions are likely to be within plus or minus half a foot. In fact, I calculated that 80% of the back transformed residuals are between minus 0.66 and plus 0.4 feet. So uh, this was considered to be good enough for interpolating the water levels. And here's what it looks like graphically. So here's a plot of the predictions for the entire study area. And you can see the areas in blue predicted to have very high water levels, areas in red very low. Of course, this is, this is on the transformed scale, which is not very useful. So let's put it in terms the wetland can understand and the human. Um, so here's what the wetland sees. The areas in blue, the median water levels, are predicted to be within 1.8 feet of the historic normal pool. That means that the blue areas would be recovered for both music and xeric associated sites. The yellow areas, <clears throat> they, they, reach, they, they meet the minus 3.1 threshold, so the xeric sites would also be considered recovered. Uh, only the xeric sites would be considered recovered in that area. When we get to the orange, the median water levels are greater than 3.1, so, so neither would be considered recovered. And we can go ahead and transfer those ratings to the map. So here we have. Uh, the, the, the green represents recovered sites, sites predicted to be recovered or within their threshold, and that's about 37% of the site. Okay, moving on to the ecological condition interpolation, I will say that the regression Krieging works so well that we're actually revisiting this ecological condition interpolation using the regression Krieging. But this is a pilot study that we did using uh, inverse distance weighting. So where can we get ecological data? There's a variety of different ecological data sets. The one that's probably the most spatially um, uh, extensive is, is a study that's performed by the Southwest Florida Water Management District about every five years. They have data sets from 1998, 2005, 2010, and then recently it was redone in 2016. And the goal of this study was really to fill in the gaps between the sites that have monitored data. So I will say that most of these 400 wetlands or so uh, do not have any water level monitoring data. This is strictly ecological data. And what, is the, what does the data look like? Um, basically, the wetlands are scored directly based on ecological emissions. This really boils down to ultimately professional opinion. And there's two different scales that have been used during the different years, which is a little bit confusing. So the three-point scale, though, uh, 
you could have a three-point scale with a wetlands or colored orange, and it represents those that are severely changed. Uh, two, the colored yellow, represents those that are significantly changed, and those colored green or, are given a rating of three on the three-point scale, and those are considered to be not significantly changed, meaning low or no stress. So the ones and the twos on the three-point scale are your stressed wetlands, the three are your non-stressed wetlands. Okay, the 1998 study gave us our most extensive coverage, and this was based on the fact that it was done, essentially researchers colored in maps. Some of that work was done in the office, um, you know, limited, limited field sampling and coloring, coloring in these maps, and we were able to transfer those ratings that were done to the GIS for a more quantitative analysis. So this just shows you the Starkey well field. And you can see this western area has some sites with significant uh, detectable or severe change. A lot of eastern Starkey is considered not changed or no stress. Here's an example of the data sheets for one of the sites. And um, there's information the researcher collects in the field. So it's about a 40 minute field visit. They collect information about what percentage of the wetland is flooded, the soil hydration conditions, uh, conditions about what's happening in the understory with the zonation. Are we, getting, are we getting some upland plants moving into the wetland, for example? They looked at historic normal pool indicators, recent normal pool indicators. Um, we also look at uh, woody successional trends. For example, in this wetland, there was an abnormal trend that was noted of wax myrtle uh, growing into the wetland transitional zone on the ground, not up on hummocks. Also notes about the canopy condition. What, what types of plants were there? Are they considered aquatic plants or terrestrial plants? How many? What's, you know, what's, uh, what's their coverage or abundance scoring? This leads to this relative estimation of wetland health. This is that professional opinion. So this site was given a four, and the investigator said the cypress were healthy and only a few uh, wax myrtle were in the transitional zone. Here's another aspect, which is kind of like a multi-metric aspect of the scoring, where the researcher scores the canopy foliage, um, how, you know, how many leaning trees, are there fallen trees, what's happening with the dominant plants? Do they tend to be obligate or fact wet? Uh, are there lots of exotic species present? Is the soil fissured or oxidized, or is it okay? What's happening with the tree and shrubs and the understory zonation, wetland hydration? Is it appropriate versus reference control for this particular sampling event. Also, what about the water level indicators? Are they beginning to creep down the tree, for example? But even though you have this multi-metric aspect, it's important to note that this really boils down to professional opinion. There's not a, a scoring system for adding up these points. Also collected photos and GPS points for the interior of the wetland and any significant indicators. And a soil assessment was done to basically look at where did the hydric soil indicators occur uh, near the edge of the wetland. There are photos associated with each of these sites, showing the interior, the exterior, and significant points. Now, again, professional opinion, but in a previous study where GPI uh, was the primary investigator, we did develop what we called a QC table in order to kind of get an idea of make sure all the investigators were on the same page. For example, a wetland health assessment of two on a five-point scale was associated with severe non-wetland plant invasion and substantial soil subsidence, whereas a wetland of four, which would be also be considered non-stressed, had good hydrology uh, or it was depressed and it returned to normal, few weedy plants and only minor soil subsidence. So just to give you some idea of what this might look like. Okay. And to do the interpolation, we compiled all the best data set we had, which we're calling 2010 conditions. We now have the 2016, but we didn't have it available at the time of the study. And there's a reason why there's so many points. We actually had 895 points available for interpolation. The colors are what you think they are. The green is represented as a three on the scale. The orange represents uh, two. Uh, I'm sorry, the yellow is two and orange is one or uh, severely stressed. And we included in this study 472 sites from the 1998 study that had no 2010 data. Remember, that study was more expensive. We went ahead and included only the no stress sites from that period with the assumption that uh, if the sites had gotten worse with a cutback in pumpage, that their declining condition was related to other factors than pumping. Uh, 
We did a inverse square distance weighted interpolation using the 12 nearest neighbors, which is actually kind of the default setting, I think, in the, in the uh, spatial analyst tool. And you can see that we get this nice pattern with some of the oranges around the well fields, and you can see where the unmonitored sites lie on this. We can, we can transfer the rating to the site, and this gives us an idea of the wetland condition at the unmonitored site. Of course, the question arises, well, how accurate is this? I mean, you're interpolating ecological conditions from one site to another. So what I did was identified a 5% sample, randomly selected sample of points to actually hold those out, do the interpolation without those points, and see could we have predicted whether they were stressed or not. And here's what I found. These are called uh, misclassification matrix or confusion matrix. So for the two-class accuracy assessment, meaning the site was predicted to be stressed and sure enough it was stressed, or the site was predicted to be non-stressed and sure enough it was non-stressed, that's these areas in green, that adds up to a 71% accuracy rate, which uh, is it's an improvement over a simple background guess uh, based on the based on the distribution of stress sites. You would have predicted a 38%. Uh, rate of stress, but instead, if you know this information about the classification from the interpolation, then you're guessing 71, which is which is a big improvement. And then for the three class accuracy, it's lower, 62%. So it gives you some idea, at least, of the accuracy. We also recognize that we, in addition to interpolating the conditions in 2010, we can interpolate change. So here we're interpolating change from 1998 to 2010, and that would use a 10 nearest neighbor inverse square distance weighted, and some, some declined by as much as two points, and some areas increased by as much as two points. And so again, we can apply the change rating, and this can go into our assessment of which bin the wetland belongs in by considering also the change assessment. So this really brings us uh, to the conclusions here in talking about uh, how this information is going to be used. We call it a weight of evidence approach. For every single of these unmonitored sites, we're going to have water level predictions for uh, the, the 2008 to 2014 period, and we're also going to have an estimation of changes as well. And we're doing that by rerunning the regression creating using uh, some additional information that we've been able to obtain. Uh, an improved median superficial aquifer drawdown, for example, will also have additional layers related to upper Florida and potentiometric surface. And we've decided that we also want to get an estimate of change in water level conditions. We think this will help us with, with binning sites. So a lot of the binning is going to happen based on the water levels. The wetland health predictions of the current conditions or the recent conditions in 2016 and the changes in conditions will be used to refine uh, what we get from the water level predictions uh, for those sites maybe that are near the threshold or if, if we want to talk about whether a site is likely to, to uh, continue to require adaptive management or perhaps even require mitigation if we think that there has not been improvement for some reason over time in either the water levels or the ecological conditions. Some subset of these sites will be, will be reviewed on screen using aerial photo interpretation in order to validate these conclusions that we draw from these analyses and um, also to look at sites where we think that there are other things happening, like, for example, surface water drainage alteration. And a subset of those sites will need to be visited in the field to confirm for sure. So in conclusion, regression creating really provides the best estimate we have of water levels at these unmonitored wetlands. Um, and coming up with the back transformed residuals of mostly most of the four, four out of five sites within about plus or minus a half a foot, I think a lot of people were surprised that we could get that accuracy uh, with the data. And um, as I mentioned, we plan to also prepare an estimate of water level change between the high and low production periods. Um, this time, instead of just the current conditions, we also want to know how much have they improved. And we found that the five-year wetland health assessment can be used to interpolate ecological conditions as well as changes in conditions. And we think the regression creating is a much better technique. So we're going to go ahead and use that now to interpolate the ecological conditions using the recently acquired wetland health assessment data. So with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions that you all have. Um, you can type your questions in a question box, and then Roy can uh, can moderate those. Dan, Thank you can for you hear your me? attention. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much, Dan. You stayed on schedule, so we appreciate that.
I have a question. The first question I have is what could be done to further improve the Russian Kriging water level predictions? Okay. Um, um, in the current implementation phase of the work, we actually have several upgrades planned. One of them is that we're using superficial aquifer drawdown data that more closely matches the years we're investigating. Um, before, and we, also before, we were only given one estimate of superficial drawdown, and it was for uh, a, a four-year period, which, which uh, part of that four-year period was included in the, in the period of 2008 to 2014, but not the entire period. Also, it was the max drawdown. So we think it may be more appropriate to use the median drawdown. So we now have a lot more information about drawdown we'll be able to use. I think that's going to increase our predictive ability. We also have another estimate of upper Florida drawdown that's being provided by Tampa Bay Water. Uh, that may or may not add to our understanding. And we're going to throw out the data sets that were of questionable use because they were developed at a statewide scale and they may not be appropriate, like, for example, the intermediate aquifer thickness. Um, and finally, we're also going to be performing regression creeping to estimate changes in water levels between the two time periods of interest, in addition to simply predicting the 2008 to 2014 period. We're going back to 1996 to 2002, which was a higher production period, and we're going to estimate the change between those two, two periods. Okay, thank you. The next question is, what do you think rainfall did not, why do you think rainfall did not turn out to be a significant factor in predicting normal pool offsets? Okay, yeah, I actually kind of had a bet on this one, so I think someone owes me a beer. Um, but uh, the main reason, I think, is that, you know, we're looking at median water levels over a seven-year period, so I think year-to-year -year rainfall variability might be expected to balance out over that time period. Also, I think, on the other hand, wetlands in the landscape are likely adapted to persistent differences in rainfall, uh, such as the fact that it might be routinely wetter along the coast. So, in other words, the actual spatial distribution of wetlands of a similar type is probably linked to the typical rainfall, landscape position, and drainage characteristics. Okay, I'm assuming you won that bet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. You don't have to tell us. The next question is, could the regression Kriging approach be used with statistical analysis procedures other than multiple linear regression combined with Kriging? Okay, absolutely. Um, I mentioned random forest in this talk, and it has a very different algorithm than linear regression. Uh, it's tree-based, involving binary recursive splitting of the data. And um, so it's going to give you, it's going to a little bit of a different answer. And you can actually go ahead and run that or, or any other machine learning type procedure and get your residuals and then perform, uh, develop a variogram using your residuals. If you see that there's a spatial autocorrelation in the residuals, you could then go ahead and um, apply the, the, uh, the, the, the Kriging technique on the residuals and therefore improve your overall estimate on future samples. Okay, thank you. I see another question. With the increased accuracy of water level data predictions by this method that you use, an understanding of median water levels threshold, is there a still value in ground-based wetland condition assessment? Okay, yeah, definitely. Um, I think we still have a very rudimentary understanding of how wetland hydrology directly affects wetland condition or health. So, I mean, even for those types of sites we think we understand, like the isolated Zurich and Mesic Cypress and Marsh sites, there's still variability in their responses to the current and past water level regimes. I mean, really every site is different. And um, some sites may have had soil subsidence that altered their typical topog uh, topography. We've had sites with several feet of soil loss. And you could have surface drainage alterations, such as ditching, that affects the on-ground conditions negatively, even if the regression creeping predictions for the site are above the threshold. So those are the kind of things that we're going to need to detect using aerophoto interpretation uh, and or ground truthing. Okay, thank you. At the onset of your presentation in your intro, it was mentioned that you would do appropriate statistical analyses. Are there other appropriate or potentially appropriate statistical tools that you could use that would accomplish what you did in this study? In other words, if you didn't do regression or regression Kriging, are there other statistical techniques out there, methodologies that could be potentially appropriate for what you studied? 
Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess, you know, I looked around a lot because I, I really did not know at the beginning, you know, when I was scoping out the research, I didn't know for sure that a spatial interpolation type approach was going to be the right answer. And in fact, in a way, the regression creeping, because it's a hybrid technique, um, when you think about it, regression, when you ignore the spatial component, is really a subset of regression creeping. And creeping, when you ignore the independent variable component, could also be viewed as a, as a, um, a subset of regression creeping. So in a sense, normal regression is, could actually be viewed as you know, uh, a subset of regression creeping. So I would say that, you know, the, um, the, important, the important thing here, I think, from whatever technique you use, it's important to realize, do you have any independent variables that can help improve your prediction of the site water levels? Um, and, and, and also then, is there a spatial component? So that, that, that's why I think really the regression creeping is probably better than anything else out there. I mean, I did look quite a bit and did quite a bit of research before I kind of stumbled upon the idea of using both the independent variables and the, um, the spatial autocorrelation component. You know, you could do all of this and ignore the independent variables. You could just do a Kriging type map estimate. And it's probably not going to be as good in certain areas where maybe the soil type is really the biggest factor factor or the drawdown is the biggest factor. And on the other hand, you could ignore the spatial component. And as we saw, the predictive ability is going to be lower. Really, really when you think about it, the, um, the fact that there is spatial autocorrelation in the residuals, what that tells us is that there's some unmeasured factors acting at a local level that we're not including in our model. But we can kind of cheat by, by making an accommodation for them using, using the spatial autocorrelation of the creeping. So um, I guess I'm, I might have to know what the question is again, but I would say that we did investigate a lot of different potential approaches, and I believe this is the best one. The question was, in the intro, we mentioned appropriate statistical analyses, and I believe you did answer that question. Okay, thanks. And based on what you just mentioned, if you have residuals and trying to account for those residuals in modeling, is, is there any add-on study or investigation that you will be doing for this work? Or you, you this is project-based and therefore you don't have funding to pursue this kind of thing further to understand what might be contained in those residuals that you mentioned? Oh, that's, yeah, I like, I like that. Interesting question. Okay, um, so, you know, that, that's, that's a really, really uh, valuable thing to think about because I know in a lot of cases, it's, it's really when things depart from the model that you find something really interesting and novel. And um, so in this case, our primary goal is, of course, to just give the best prediction we can. And I, and I believe that we're at that point with this technique. And so other than that we're now revisiting which independent variables we're including and trying to get a more refined estimate of drawdown and, and hope to improve things overall. However, I, I, I do like this comment and I, I think it's, Definitely, we'll be plotting the residuals versus some other variables that we have to see if there's something in terms of the independent variables that we that we might have missed that for some reason might not have been important enough to be to be included in the um, the regression creeping, but turn out to still be able to explain the residuals. And if that happens, we'll we'll try to work them in. So I like this idea. This this is kind of like the idea of successive deepening. Do your analysis look at the residuals, is there, is there anything you missed? So I would say that um, it may not be part of our scope for the implementation, but it's certainly something that we're going to pay attention to. So thank you for the comment. Okay, very good, thank you. I don't see any additional questions at this time, and it is about seven minutes to one o'clock. So if you don't have any additional thoughts or comments for us, I will then close out this webinar and go over a couple of the housekeeping issues. Okay. All right. Well, I will just say thank you, everyone, for your attention. And, uh, you know, feel free to send me an email if you have questions about regression creating. Um, I'd be happy to send you, you know, the sample code that I use to run an R. Um, that's an appendix to a report that we did for Tampa Bay Water. And um, anyway, so that's it. Feel free to correspond with me. My email address is on there. And thank you again.
Thank you, Dan. As a reminder, webinar certificates worth one hour of participation are available upon request. Please contact SWS staff if you have interest. Certificates are also available for those who watch webinar recordings. All webinars are recorded and archived for complimentary viewing by members on our past webinars page. Please mark your calendars for our next webinar. The September webinar will be Thursday, September 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And the title for that presentation will be Comparative Studies of the Variation Primary Producer Density, Diversity rather, and Dominance in Subtropical Wetlands presented by Luca, Professor Luca Marazzi. Please mark your calendars for our, works, our next webinar. The September webinar, as I mentioned, will be September 21st at 1 p.m. You are always looking, we're always looking for future presenters and topics, so if you're interested in presenting an SWS webinar or have a topic of interest you would like to see us cover, please indicate this in the evaluation survey when you receive at the conclusions of this webinar, so stand by for that. It's never too early to save the date to join us May 29th to June 1st, 2018 in Denver, Colorado, USA for the 2018 SWS annual meeting. The meeting website is now live. Visit swsannualmeeting.org to stay up to date on all meeting developments. It's that time of year. The program committee is now accepting symposium workshop proposals for the 2018 meeting. Visit the website for more information and complete the proposal form. Submission for deadline is October 16th. Lastly, thank you again, Dan, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to present an SWS webinar. And thanks to the audience for attending today. We hope you can join us for the upcoming webinar it's September. So that concludes today's webinar. And thank you again, Dan, and thank you again, participants. You're welcome. Thank you, Roy.